Good evening. Good afternoon. How are you? Welcome along. Uh, inspire and be inspired. It's another weekly conversation, uh, motivational talks and life hacks. And I can see that already we've got people commenting. So welcome along to the stream, guys. Uh, my name is Andy Ward, in case you're not aware. And every once in a while, I like to bring some uh, quite inspirational, influential people onto the stream with me to uh, share words of wisdom and also piece together uh, some of my broken memories. Uh, and in this particular uh, talk, we call it Brum as Fuck, excuse the profanity, but I think it sums up the conversation quite nicely. I've got two guys who uh, can really shed the light on the Birmingham house music scene and even before. So first of all, hi to Jeff, hi to Dave. Thank you for the comments, guys. I can see you're locked on. And I'll also say uh, a shout out to everyone that's coming back and watching the recording because we get a hell of a lot of people who don't catch us live but are interested in what we've got to say. Shouts out to Pax as well. If you have any questions, if you've got any comments throughout the course of the conversation, then please do leave them. I'll do my best to address them, but we're going to be deep in conversation. So let's get involved, shall we? I invite my guests onto the screen and say hi to Mr. Jockley and Mr. IMD. How are you, gentlemen? Good afternoon. Good evening, sir. How you Thanks, doing? mate. Yeah, good to uh, see you. Good. I've got to say, we were just talking before we went live, and uh, most definitely the tightest we've got it looking on the screen. You both look incredible. You both sound great. And I'm thoroughly, thoroughly... Got uh, me fresh haircut. There you go, you see. Is that looking the same in the hair. And number one, actually, it's funny you say that because I forgot to mention when we went on air, when we began, I absolutely look disgraceful. Uh, I don't care. It's only, it's only the lads. Do you know what I mean? It's only the lads. So I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because uh, it's going to be quite a... I'm going to do an introduction and then I'm keeping my mouth shut. It's all about you guys talking all, all evening. So my very brief introduction is going to be quite unbalanced, really, because between the two of you, I know one very well for over three decades and the other I know relatively little of, really. Uh, Jock will explain the story of how we know each other uh, and how our early paths took us onto a crazy, crazy journey. And IMD, uh, I, as I say, know very little of uh, personally, and yet he is an undoubted legend on the Birmingham scene, and he's going to be able to fill me in on the background of how it all began. So I will start off by very quickly saying hi to Jack. Thank you for joining me, my man. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having us on. And uh, I will go first of all to Mr. IMD, uh, legend uh, in his own right. I'll ask you to introduce yourself to the people who may not be familiar with who you are uh, from outside of Birmingham, because I don't think there's anyone in Birmingham who won't be aware of you. Uh, tell us who you are. The roughly, you know, when you were born, which will put a timestamp on your early days uh, and how you started on the journey on the house scene. All right. Uh, good evening to everybody. Um, right, I'm going to introduce myself. My name's DJ IMD, and a lot of people don't know the full acronym in terms of IMD, which stands for the Infinitive Mix Master D. Um, I started my early beginnings um, basically listening to jazz, jazz funk, and so forth. Um, so about the age of 15, I got the I got the hip hop bug, and the main catalyst I got into DJing was one day I was walking, walking along, and I was desperate to get this mixer that in uh, Tandy's or these called Lasky's, and I was walking down with my head down, and uh, I saw 30 bands, and I don't know if you can remember back in the day you could do a lay by on products, so I put this lay by on this mixer. Funny enough. I was looking for the actual first, I was going to show it to you, the first mixer I ever used, you know, to DJ with. So at the age of 15, there's me with this little mixer with a click in the middle. And my dad's old Gerard, I don't know if you remember the Gerard decks. You the know, with, the, yeah, you know, the ones, ones. that the old, the old grams. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. With wads of paper underneath. And there's me trying to do the Grandmaster Flash. So that's how I actually started in my bedroom. And then from there, um, I managed to get a, a spot at a club in Anzurf called the Ridgeway. Okay. Is, so you, you were born mid to late 60s, am I correct? 
mid mid sixties. Yeah, don't worry. Mm, <laughs> yeah, okay, so that, that'll yeah. do. Mid sixties, mid sixties will do. Yeah, just I mean, I mean, I was talking to you earlier, and then I sort of stuck my fingers up and started to do all the counting. I'm thinking, rah, you're talking over four decades mm-hmm. of DJ, you know. So I've gone through the whole spectrum um, of the different genres. We started off with the the jazz funk, um, the old days. And then from when the old days sort of pitted out, I was part of the, what you call the soul movement, mm-hmm. which was not just Birmingham, but this was a Manchester thing, a Bristol, a London thing, where a lot of us were young and the jazz funk, I mean, the old days scene had died, died its death. Um, general clubs, as, as you know, wouldn't let us in, even though we dressed from top to bottom in shirts and tie and the whole shebang. Um, and also it was a Birmingham, you remember, was a very reggae Either, had, either you were reggae or you were either sort of chart music and, you know, you went up town with your white shirt and your pun trousers and, you know, you get into Sam Weller's or one of those sort of places. So what we did, we decided we're going to create our own scene, which was a soul underground scene where we had uh, various sound systems. And funny enough, we've been talking over the last couple of years about doing our reunion because this is where we started to do a lot of the house parties. Okay. The, the warehouse parties and so forth. So initially I started off in a sound called Crushback. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we did, like I said, Jock mentioned earlier about the, the warehouse parts. We used to do a lot of warehouse parties, big houses. Sometimes we'd get to the point where Friday, even Saturday morning, we didn't have a venue. Wow. And, and then somebody would phone and said, we've got a venue. So we'd go, run down, forget about all these fancy flyers. We're talking about going to the local shop that's got a, a scanner scribbling down the address and not even cutting it, just ripping it. And even before you could rip it, people are snatching it out of your hand. You know, so, and then so you're have... talking pre-house house music, house parties with soul, yeah. reggae, yeah, R&B, yeah, yeah. jazz funk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But around that era, if you can remember, this is when a lot of the Chicago house stuff was coming through. So you're talking 85, 86 kind of times. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of the stuff, we, we, we anything, you know, we weren't very particular in terms of... Um, the genre, we were more on the one. If it's got a, if it's got a beat, it's got bass, and it's got a bit of soul in it. We just incorporated it into into what we were playing. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, um, so a, a brief introduction into your early days. Then, uh, Jock, I think you and I are more or less the same age, late sixties, I would say for yourself. Yeah, okay, yeah. So you've probably you've probably got eighteen months on me. Uh, so tell us, uh, I know your story, but share, sh- introduce yourself and, and share your story. Yeah. Um, so I've sort of got fairly well known, um, in 1989 from doing the snapper club. Uh huh. Um, no, we don't, we don't want to know about that. I want you to take me back before all that. that. Okay. So we met, you know, as we used to be, um, hanging about in Sutton Parade as youngsters, um, loosely associated with the football lads and whatever and um used to drinking well long before drinking weren't it sort of we were 15 and whatever that's and it. then proceeded to a bit older drinking you know uh, pubs in sutton um for myself clubbing wise um i was a real indie kid uh so i used to go to snobs a lot um but uh, I used to also go to various other things. I used to go to um, the Powerhouse. I can't remember what night it was. I used to go there and Zigzags and uh, Gary Daniel and Mark Wilson used to play there um, at, at both. One was like an indie 60s thing and the other one was all sorts and they started playing. That was the first people I heard playing house um, in Birmingham. But it's, it didn't really take the bug for me then, uh, but I liked it. Um, but it wasn't until about 88 that I sort of got the house, much more into house from uh, going to the um, hypnosis, which was Lee Fisher and John Slowey's night on a Thursday, the small ring. In the Hummingbird. In the hummingbird, which was the first weekly acid house thing. Okay, so t- tell, the, tell the story that you started to, you, you told us before we went on air, because you were saying, we I, I was the one who said, there's so many uh, parts of the story that I'm not going to share with you because of our early days knocking about in Sutton Coalfield. Yeah, Sutton Coalfield, a part of Birmingham. 
you know, infamous Sundays of uh, going up Sutton Park and trying not to get caught up in the Villa Blues running battles and all those kind of things. And you said that that is actually quite an important part of the story because of how the promotions and everything else began. Well, yeah, I mean, lo- most of my mates were uh, Villa um, football. You know, we're not all my, all were football lad, but the ones we used to hang about with, the ones you know. Um, but at the time, people, if, if you were like Villa or Blues, Blues basically had control of the city centre in terms of where you could go and drink. Mm-hmm. There was a couple of places like the Winds of the Cabin and uh, I don't know if you ever went there, Le Pub, which was awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that, you, that we could go to. Um, and then a bit about 86, that Willie's, not Willie's, but uh, Mega Wine Bar mm-hmm. used to go a bit more trendy and decent music. Um, but the hum, the hummingbird, including the, the, the in eighty eight, was, was a lot was a place where um, we could go without any grief, really. Mm-hmm. When you say um, we, you're talking about yourself and all you Aston Villa. Myself football. and my mates. I mean, I didn't get as much grief because mm-hmm. a lot of I did know quite a few uh, the uh, blues like um, like Cockney B and that because they lived by me. Um, but because me and my mate Marzi were were man new, we didn't really get as much grief. But most, you know, and talking about we as in the collective of mates. So we used to go to what was the Kipper Club um, uh, towards the end of 88. Because it was basically somewhere you could go. We wouldn't get any grief. You could do, you know, what you wanted. Um, and it got to about the spring, because we used to go there a lot. And we used to go after there, we used to go, and my mate Sean Conboy had... Um, a house in Pie Pays, we, you know, so, you know, we used to go there after drinking or whatever. And, and my mate Marzi just said, OK, right, I'm going to go and get us in to me and him. Because we, the year before, we used to do like a little indie hip hop, whatever thing down at the Turk's Head. We did that for a few months called Society Sound. So we that was our first uh, go at DJ. And even though we were terrible, we had like a Davy Double Dex thing and, and one the odd a bit, week. A, bit, a, on, bendy, yeah. a bendy light and <laughs> Yeah, we had the full kit, and it, one week it, only one of the decks was working, so one of our mates had to go on the mic. And, <laughs> so, yeah, so Marsley went up and spoke to Mr. Blake and said we had a following, um, which in a way, because it was all our mates in there, it looked like it was. And uh, then quickly, because they, we, so we started playing with the, the resident there, Steph, um, mostly awful music. Like as you were saying before, which you'd be hearing something like Earth the Kit Chacha Heels, and then we'd come on um, with something like Strings of Life. <laughs> it just it was mad. So as it grew and grew, you know, it quickly filled up from like 50 to like 300, filled the room. And uh, I think she just had enough and left. So Mr. Blake gave it to us. And then quickly, you know, it was week by week. We, I mean, we were, we were into the main room. You know, it was like just great. It just great. I think it was 89 is when it just exploded across the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, no way saying I was anywhere first or anything, or, you know, it was late to the game with house music, to be honest. Um, but I was just lucky in the right place. And it just it just took off. So from, I think we started in the like, late spring. Uh, and by, by August, it was like 3,000 people in. It just Crazy. went just mental. It just so it, exploded. So it started off as the Kipper Club, first of all. Then it Kipper went Club to the Snapper Club. It was a separate promotion. Okay. Um, the, the the promoter left to go and do it somewhere else. Um, I think it was a fellow who was known, Gay John. That was his name. And so Mr. Blake then, you know, changed the name, One Fish, to the Snapper, mm-hmm. you know, National yeah. Fish Jamaica. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> There it goes, and basically, yeah. So it was a snapper club, but it really became the snapper club as it then, as it was, as it's known um, when okay. me and Mars took it over. Really, right? Okay. So, uh, Devon, I'm going to come to yourself. Uh, I just want to make this as interactive as I can. So, to everyone mm-hmm. watching, thank you for being here, guys uh, and girls. Um, 
do leave comments, do leave any messages that spring to mind as the guys are talking because I'm sure they'll come back and uh, read them uh, and any shout outs I'll give along the way. So thank you for being here. So uh, listening to that, uh, oh, Andrew Milford pops up and says, uh, a treasure of Brum, Jock. You are a treasure of Brum. Uh, so Deverell, listen, listening to those those uh, tales of the hummingbird, would you have have ever ventured into the hummingbird when it started to get popular or were you busy doing your other thing by that your other oh god your yeah things? um we were very tight with um uh, with, with the hummingbird we did our own um all days and, and jock can remember they booked me to play at the at the snapper club do you remember jock i do yeah i mean as yeah. i was saying yeah 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 so, somehow i ended up at um, one of your warehouse parties at the back of dudley road yeah yeah god knows how i ended up there um, I think that was uh, sometime in 89, wasn't it? Yeah. And, um, yeah, I was come up to you at the end, and you and Spats, wasn't it? Um, Spats. Was it Spats? No, no, no. That was, back then, it was Crush Pack. That was myself, a flirty Bertie, and Tintin, who was part of uh, Love okay, Injection. Okay, I, I must have got it. Yeah. Um, but I asked, yeah, so then I asked you to, because we were just getting ready to do the first um, uh, House All Dayer, and yeah. you know, uh, asked you to play at that, yeah. and known each other um, since then. So it's Insa insanity think. for me because all of this is such a blur for, for various reasons back then. You know, but ironically, you know, when you asked me earlier to make an introduction, there's one big chunk I sort of missed out of that. Okay. Um, where I think where I've become a bit of a, an enigma because people know me from various and particular scenes that. That um, but what, right. Sorry about that. Someone just distracted me. No worries, mate. Carry on. Coat. Oh Lord, the mercy. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of people know me from various different different sort of scenes because initially I came up uh, as as a hip hop DJ. Um, and not sort of boasting or pushing up myself in any way. I was the first hip hop scratch mix DJ in the whole of the, of, of the West Midlands, mm -hmm. you know, um, we started off a workshop at uh, Cannonhill Park. So if you're like an early hip hop head, you'd know me from the Cannonhill sessions where we used to, where we used to do, I used to have the decks and I used to scratch and then we used to teach the kids how to body pop and break dance. I've yeah. seen some videos of that. I think uh, Rob Johnson, yeah. he was a mad popper and he was, yeah, he was yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, in a nutshell, um, I was a DJ for the B-Boys and the Birmingham City Breakers. And, and part of the B-Boys, as you know, Andy, uh, Kiddo was one mm -hmm. of the B-Boys. Mm -hmm. And also Goldie was one of the B-Boys as well. So, you know, and then we did that for quite a few years. You know, we did trade fairs, we did shows up and down the country. We did, um, you know, adverts, we did, um, you know, You've been on a couple of document, couple of documentaries. Central TV up, up at the library, right? There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember it well. Hi, Andrea. Hi. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Carry on. Sorry. Yeah, and and um, you know, it's, it's just like a, a, a almost like a conveyor belt, really. Because I mean, um, where's where in Brum, um, DJ wise? Um, I've, I think I've one of the longest residences. Uh, Jack sort of mentioned the name Willie's Wine Bar. Yes. I DJed at Willie's Wine Bar for, I think, religiously on a Saturday for something like 18 years. You know, we used to have people from as far as, like, Scotland. Remind, remind me where Willie's was. You know, me too. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Summer, Summer Row, is it? Summer Row, yes. yes. Yeah, on yeah, the yeah. very corner, that, that used to be Willie's, Willie's Wine Bar. Okay. Oh, I thought that was always a place that black people couldn't go. You couldn't get no, in. No, 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 no. Initially, Willie's, I mean... The joke behind that, oh, well, part of the, well, I'm not taking credit for it, but part of the concept behind um, the I'll Meet You uh, concept was um, the fact that we used to do Willie's Wine Bar and everybody used to be hanging outside saying, why can't we, why can't we, you know, a club that plays this kind of music and we can play, stay till late. So myself and the owner, we made an inquiry for a couple of doors up the road. It was one of those dodgy, um, titty, well, if I should say one, no, you, uh, can, you can say them, you know, titty by them, you, yeah. You, you know, when those guys used to show films and all that sort of stuff, and so they came oh, back with the big, us. with the big long anoraks, the big long, coats. yeah, that, oh, there you go, yeah. <laughs> so they came back to they came back to us with something like ridiculous, uh, um, rent, something like 150,000 a year for the rent, so that sort of died to death, and then 
Mark and all of a sudden Mark and Keith came in and uh, the, all that concept was done. But I mean, up until that point, I was DJing there for 18 and that was one of the unique, rarest bars in Birmingham where, you know, I'm talking where you had like people, I'm talking really minted, mm-hmm. you know, we had celebrities from Central was just across the way mm-hmm. and you'd have students from just up, up the road and everybody used to just mock in and everybody didn't give a crap who you were. They're just into good company, good music, you know. That's a bit, and then, uh, definitely a blank in my memory. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you were there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, that's various things. Like, I mean, played at the Dome, played at um, um, Powerhouse, played at the, um, we did loads of, um, <laughs> we did loads of like all dayers. Um, I don't know if um, Jock can remember. You remember TCB Fresh, Jock? Um, rings a bell. These were promoters and these were guys that came from like the reggae scene. And they saw what we were doing and all they saw was chiching. So they started putting on all days and they hired uh, uh, the sound system I was with and well, at the time was a uh, crush pack. But the joke was we'd absolutely pack the place out, ram, you know, the small room and the big room at, at, at the, um, at, at, at the, um, at the club. And we'd spend something like two, three, four hours hanging outside in the, in the foyer waiting to get paid, mm. you know, and, you know, and, and that was one of the sort of catalysts why, you know, we sort of went back on the ground and decided, you know something, we don't need these fly-by-night sort of promoters, you know, sort of jumping in, trying to make a quick buck out of out of what's happening on the actual scene itself. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, Bruce, yeah. Bruce, Bruce, I mean, Brum over the years. Bruce Q yeah. pops in and says, uh, I've had the honour of working with both of these legends. He's definitely no yeah. fly-by-night promoter, Bruce yeah. Q. <laughs> I'll bring, I've got yeah. Bruce to mention yet. He's, in, he's on my list. Yeah. You know what I mean, like I said, I could real life. I mean, and this is why, I've, like I said, I've become an enigma because I mean, I've been DJing for over four, well over four decades. You know I mean, I could mention things like um, Soul Fraternity. Mm-hmm. You know, that was one of the main soul nights. Um, Branston's is that, is on that, a, uh, the Karimo's party. Lucas is and his brother. Yes. Spy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because uh, where I used to, Lucas was one of the, the leading sales reps when I was at Choice FM. So that's the only reason I know about Soul Fraternity. Right. And I'll tell you, uh, before I go back on, I'll tell you a funny joke about Choice FM. I remember when um, they were setting up Choice FM and I was headhunted. Okay. Um, but then a little bird told me Kiss was coming to Birmingham. So they said to me, hold out for Kiss. Oh, right. What a lemon. Uh, <laughs> they went by past uh, Birmingham and went up to, uh, I think it was Manchester <laughs> or Nottingham, you know. But right. um, yeah, I did, you know, like Jock, we did we did the old um, pirate radio thing and so on. So yeah, you, as, as you, you know, you touched on um, the Lucas thing. And I mean, Branston's on a Sunday, you know, that was a legendary night. You know, that night went for how many years? About five, six years. Until until it, it sort of morphed into wobble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and there's this, this various nice type nights we support on at Jasmine's. Mm-hmm. Jasmine's. Yeah, Jasmine's. Jasmine's. Cool. Upper Digbeth, gone now. Yeah. Next to the just next to the George pub, which is gone. Yeah. Jasmine's. Did you used to go, did you used to have anything to do with um, Salvation upstairs at the Paris? Salvation. That was a bit. And that's another part of the like album. Thing, wasn't it? Punk and soul thing. It, it, it was a bit clicky. Oh, yeah. It was a bit clicky, even though, you know, um, I had all the records that, you I mean, because I was one of the earliest people to start collecting the old James Brown. You know, and funny enough, going up in the loft the other day, I found all the original, even promo people's seven inches and stuff. So I used to collect all that stuff, but because of like, um, I sort of poked my nose in, yeah, can I have a spin? And they'd be like, no, 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 no. no. So I thought, right. okay, cool. We'll just go. I mean, Basically, the way I've always been in terms of longevity or um, or want of a better word, um, being sticking to my principles is I'll knock on your door. If you're not letting me in, I'll, I'll go and find my own door. Mm-hmm. You know, and, 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 and that is always how I've, I've sort of rolled is where you slam the door in my face. It's not going to stop the love of me playing my music. You know, it's, as you know, Andy and Jock, it's when you DJ, it's like you're giving a piece of yourself to the public, you're you're giving your interpretation on 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 music of how you see music, and nine times out of ten, most of the people will reciprocate mm-hmm. and enjoy and enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, it, most definitely. Well, um, <clears throat> just looking here, Johnny Greaves, 
uh, pops up and says he used to do a punk night at the Hummingbird uh, between 85 to 88. And he remembers playing with Steph as well. And then he remembered how much it changed Jock when you came in and started playing there. So mm. uh, the, as well mm. as knowing you for years prior to that, um, knocking about on the streets, trying to pull girls, then girls were out the picture and it was all about that dance floor at, at the Hummingbird. And, you, mm. you know, you say you don't want to try and take any credit for 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 being the first to do anything, but it was completely life changing times. Um, those those Fridays at the Hummingbird, you know, and, and what they I, went on to be, become. I think it was a, it was an important club because um, a couple of things. It was when it be, I think it was around the country blowing up, but it was where it blew up in um, Birmingham certainly because the numbers. I think I don't think there was many clubs in the country that were pulling three thousand a week. As like a club, there were, you know, you had your illegal rave, but they weren't weekly clubs. Maybe Heaven or something at the Storia, but that's probably it in the country. Uh, well, what you've done, Jack, was important because, like I mentioned before, it, it, either it was it was a very much a meat and two veg town where you had the typical Sam Wellers and you know all these other you know clubs where it was just like I said the black pun trousers and and the, the, oh, white, yeah. the white shirts and then you guys came along and, and basically you know in, in in essence what you did with um with Lloyd you're almost like the rebels in town because everything was very organized because I know for a fact a lot of the bar if you're an independent in in the city center or you're one of the major um um, um breweries let's say nightclubs it was a fact that you know you couldn't really get a look in Mm -hmm. So when you did the Kipper Club, that sort of created a, a, an underground scene in the city centre. Where could you find something? Fair enough, you've got like latter years, you had snobs and, and then latter On years. On the indie had... side, yeah. Yeah. There yeah. wasn't many places playing house in, in Brum. There was a few, like Steve Griffiths used to do Hudson Bay, Dick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Persons that just scenes. But there was no big weekend thing, no big no, club. No, um, And I think one of the things that it's important for I think it was the club that, um, well, it, it certainly united in terms of racially bringing mass numbers of black mm -hmm. and white people together yeah. for the first time ever in the city. Yeah. Um, you know. This was the love of, love of the music, like, wasn't it? Yeah. So it was the love of music and it was the same as, we, as I uh, briefly put on before. It was um, the change of um, the thing between the football in, in and again this happened around the country mm -hmm. the uh, the Eckies came in and people who were fighting each other a few weeks before were all hugging each other and working together and then that, a lot of those people who came there from that time then you've got things like Time, Raw um, Walton and them went and do Spectrum uh, Steve Lawler first club he ever went to playing house music and he, he puts it in his documentary that that was it you know Pete Gooding as well um, so a lot of the people who went on to become DJs, mate, you know, even like with yourself and that with Soul Central and your your other stuff, um, your other partner in Soul Central, Tim, you know what I mean? These people, that was it was our and it was our thing. It was you know everywhere else had its other thing like Hacienda or whatever, but it was ours, and um, it was to the majority of people it was new. Mm -hmm. And it's why people have, I think, have got such um, love for it because it was ours and it grew with us. I remember vividly, yeah. and I'm sure you'll remember, uh, <clears throat> going to the Hummingbird on a Friday night and they'd be running battles between the Villa Blues through the club one week. And then there was one infamous night where Mr. Blake got onto the, onto the microphone and he, and he made a, a big speech about, you've all got to stop this. My, I think he said, my daughter goes out with a white man and you've all got to stop. And and then the, the next, like you say, within like two or three yeah, weeks, the, the harmony was, was. was we, we all came together. There was one big incident in the small room where it really was, was you know, it was horrible in there with the fighting. And then but very quickly, I could say, we moved into the big room and it sort of, it, it was... You know, like the people with, yeah, they just got together. It was like it just it just changed within weeks, and and um, yeah, we all remember Mr. Blake's speeches because I, I remember before and uh, when they wanted to shut it down because he was having NWA on and so and a lot of the thing was as well that the police and the licensing didn't like the fact that um, it was again lots of 
mixed it was mixed with all sorts of different people and they they you know before they like keeping that um you know that wedge between people because mm-hmm. it, it's good for them mm-hmm. so, so did, uh, sorry carry on no no i was going to say uh Dever, so you you were talking. Um, uh, uh, it's all this all runs concurrently. Uh, it's, so it's it's great to hear the the different sides of the track, so to speak. You know, in mm. the second city towards the eighty eight to, to nineteen ninety. What was the what was the natural progression for yourself? Well, well, well I can well before I move on to that, the irony was it was like uh, the end of one particular era, and it was the beginning of another era in in regards to. Um, all the underground venues we used to do. I don't know if you remember the Greens yeah. um, on the Winston Green Road. We <laughs> would... Jack used to book me to play there once or twice. Right. Years. But you wonder, the irony with that is we went into the Greens, we approached them, the place was like a shithole. Yeah. <laughs> we to went to say there. the least. To say yeah. the and least. we went in there and we painted the place, fixed the place up. And I remember we used to do a, 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 late, a late night Saturday till... Sunday Sunday morning thing with, with the sand crush I mean crush group I mean tough groove and then one that I think was it Mickey Finn or somebody had a rave and it, it basically got locked down by the police and so one of the guys in in the sound system decided oh let them have the main room and I said to him you know as good as killed our night because we can compete with the, with with the ravers in regards to they're going to bring in X amount of heads in, they're going to drink the bar dry, et cetera. So within a week, two weeks, we got booted. Okay. And, and that's probably when Jack came in then, is he? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think, and you then, know, as you know, Clark, he, who ran it, he was a bit of a, you know, he was well known for double booking and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, I remember, I think I did the first house thing there, which was uh, end of 89. Friend, um, Foxy, Dorman, on the, he put on something there because he knew... Um, Clark in them from the Hummingbird, yeah, and he won an all day. It wasn't very successful, and yeah, yeah. I think um, I, I think um, we started doing it about sometime end of nineteen ninety one, and uh, yeah, yeah, it was like so again, it probably double booked us with you, and then yeah, like, well, I said, well, we got booted out. It's, it's the same thing with um, the Mosley Mosley Dance Centre, yeah, yeah. The same thing again. We put the Moses Dance Centre to uh, some friends of ours had a promotion called Time Tunnel, and we used to do. I think it's every, I think it's every month or fortnight at uh, the Moses Dance Centre, and we used to absolutely ram that place out. And then, with the advent of the actual rave scene itself, again we got turfed out the door, and the rave scene sort of that you know, was a, prop, that was a proper little sweat box. That Moses Dance Centre, proper yeah, yeah, little yeah, sweat yeah, box. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. You're talking about that. Jack, you remember you remember the sweat box in Ockley? In Ho- yeah, the one the where cream went, your place. Yeah, well that behind one. it was, it was like behind some shops and, and the, the the name behind the sweat box was in a circle. Was, yeah, there you go. It was a big yeah, room. Yeah. Well, biggish room. And then you'd go in and then people would be asking the question, why is it called sweat box? So the place would be ram. And at about I'd say about two, three o'clock, all of a sudden you start feeling drip drip yeah yeah and so everybody's sweat was literally dropping off the ceiling yeah i put one party on there me and lee fisher and uh sean combo put a, a, a rave on in there mm. and we had these massive um smoke machines so you just couldn't see <laughs> and uh in the morning um lisa a friend of ours who was she used to have a van uh she was too spangled to drive the sound back to it was the we had the sound from the man up um Sally oak uh, by um, what was the Rich Beach, was it? Yeah, we've yeah. had the sound from there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know if you remember, there was a cafe or a bakery next door. Yeah. So we blagged some blokes, some builders, to uh, who were um, getting the breakfast to give us a lift back on an open back truck with his sound system, <laughs> like <laughs> spit spangled and uh, down the, the Bristol Road. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that was one of the first sort of illegal raves that we did. And then we did a couple afterwards down in Borsalif. Our friend was. Yeah. His, uh, mm-hmm. um, Shout out to, uh, hi to Ian Ancorn and Steve Carroll, who are all, all passing through to say hi. Shouts out to Irv stateside as well. Um, yeah, so the changing of the guard, we, we, it, it, that phrase has been used quite a few times, uh, Deverell, the changing of the guard. Mm-hmm. And, and so when you were getting turfed out, what was the next step for you? 
Well, then I, I think the, the next step was to, you know, obviously I was still still doing Willie's wine bar along all, along along that line. Um, like I said, I was doing Soul Fraternity. I was doing um, what was there? There was um, Time Tunnel. There was like various. There was like a loose collective of, of DJs, friends, and promoters that were doing stuff um, in terms of uh, putting nights on. Mm-hmm. And there was Morris. Uh, what's his Whittingham? You know, the designer where he used to put on, um, what's the name of his, he had a night, I can't remember the name of it. He used to do a lot of stuff down at uh, Liberties. I okay. think that's where I actually saw you for the first time. I'd heard your name, okay. Andy, but never actually heard about this young this young guy coming up and he is he, good, you know. And then I remember going down in the room at the back at Liberties, I think you were DJing. And I wanted to introduce myself, but you were so focused on what you were doing. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd catch you another time. Okay. You know, but um, but then from there, we, I, I, I had, was part of a collective of a sound system called Tough Groove, where we were the out and out, literally f- funked out of our heads. Mm-hmm. You know, we went against the grain. When everybody else was going rave, we went deeper into like the James Brown, the Parliament, the funk, you know, and we, you know, really, and, and it was, it's a bit of a, a weird one as well, because even though we'd be right back nostalgic into the funk and the rare groove, we'd be rocking hip hop mm-hmm. alongside it. You know, so we created our own sort of, you know, but to be honest, we were probably the Birmingham equivalent of um, Soul to Soul. Okay, so give me some names of the rest of the crew then. Right, there was Moose, um, Dr. Funk, and as um, as uh, Jock mentioned, Spats was part, part, part of the crew as well. We had another gentleman by the name of KGB from London. You know, so we'd be doing various parties all over the place. You know, we did festivals, you know, we did gigs up and down the country, you know, and that went as far as, I think it was, was about 90, I think it was about 97 or something then, as most things do, you sort of people left to go to uni in London and, and we sort of slowly went, went, went our own way. Mm-hmm. But during that window as well, I, I, I heavily got into um, production. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, the, the guy I was working with, um, Gilly G. Okay. I was just going to say, was it Gilly? Yeah. Well, let, 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 let me let me pause you there then, because we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to mm-hmm. I want to allow Jock to continue telling the story mm-hmm. of the the whirlwind. Again, I say mm-hmm. to everybody, we can't really fill in every piece of the jigsaw as we're talking because yeah. between. Mm-hmm. 89 1990 to 92 yeah, 93 yeah, yeah. It, there's there's so many so many things influential times jock you would say on the the rave scene in birmingham you're talking about you know that we went from the big clubs we went from the warehouses into the main clubs we had the rag market all those kind mm. of things uh yeah. tell us about some of the most important and look, we haven't spoken about the record store as well working with yeah, yeah. so i mean for, for me, I think one of the challenges where I was the first sort of big rave in, in Birmingham, well, it wasn't in Birmingham, it was in uh, Polesworth in Tamworth, Spectrum. That was the first time people had seen like a London style uh, production, which was Simon, it was Simon Rain who went on to do Gatecrasher. Um, and although I'd been to his club before, that's the first time I met Lee um, through uh, my mate Belcher, who took me before. And um, we sort of got talking. Lee came back to Brom and uh, we sort of hooked up from there as friends and started putting parties on. And uh, he played a few times. At the, he used to do the Friday at the Hummingbird. Um, but then from that, I then started working. They, they started Pure Records, I think, in 91, him and another pal of mine, uh, Baxter. The Mark Baxter. Well, we've, had, um, we've had Lee on and tell all of this story, yeah, but yeah, it's interesting yeah. to, okay. to get your perspective. So they started <clears> the um, Pure in um, the depot, not the depot, Folio 50, mm. uh, Big Danny's brother's place. Mm-hmm. So I was uh, working for them for a while. Uh, that's So that was the first time we're working in a record shop. Um, and uh, then go for, so yeah, so you're saying about stuff with the rag market, um, I started work doing uh, Starlight, I think it was about 91. I started playing for them on Starlight FM. Okay. Uh, I used to do some regular shows on there. Lee was on there, John Slowey. But it was um, uh, Sean Conboy used to do. And, but, so there wasn't many of us doing house shows. Um, though flipping back, the first house show I did before that was uh, for Foxy on Laser FM. 
don't know if you remember that station, uh, Dev. Vaguely. Uh, Vaguely. I, was, I, was, I was a kiss of it. Mean, um, yeah. Yeah. And um, so we, um, I've lost track of where I was. <laughs> You're talking <laughs> about working with Pure. Uh, yeah, so Pure. Marketing. And then um, from that, then in uh, 93, they started uh, Boston Records. Mm. And uh, I got the job as labor. Well, it, I was the label manager, run every <laughs> type of job. You, um, had, you, had the ti- you had the title on the business card. Of- <laughs> I had the title, <laughs> label manager, which was, you know, brilliant. You know, we had some we had a big hit with Mother Funks Up, which was Lee and uh, Jules's thing. Mm. And at the same time, there was um, the, which was an, one of the first jungle labels, Rough Tone, which was uh, because Rough, so Rough Tone and Boston were sister labels. And it was quite a big collective of directors. So you had Earl, Jerry and Patrick from UB40, Belcher and Baxter, Lee and another fellow called Colin. So they were the directors of both. Um, Rob Saunders ran Rough Tone and uh, I ran Boston. Um, and Danny so, was in the building as well, wasn't he? Sorry? Danny. Danny Kane. He was in. The, he was upstairs, wasn't he, at the time? Um, was, he there? was he there then? Or no, no. This moved the, there first, yet? the first Boston place was down in Digbeth. Oh, uh, right, and then you moved to... With Danny, a bit yeah, late, yeah. so in uh, sort of 99. Right, I'm yeah. with you. I'm uh, but yeah, the there. Boston one, um, which was brilliant, you know, we it's like I was licensing big tracks from Italy and all sorts and licensing stuff all over the world. And it was just like, well, yeah, that's jumped on you. And it was a real eye-opener. Um, but as you were saying about things, uh, so like Starlight, I started being resident for them in the... Uh, as was termed the mellow room. Um, and I also ended I was ended up becoming resident for Pandemonium. It was like um, mates of ours who started doing these parties in Tamworth, which was uh, Archer, Paul Dorks and uh, Chamberlain. And, Wasn't it Telford? Um, Telford, sorry, what am I talking about? So they started in little one, little uh, little community centres. I think Tim played the first one. I was one. going to so say, how... Timmy, Timmy Vegas is on a, on a video from one of the first ones, setting it yeah, up. It's yeah, like, it's like, def- it's like a stick insect. And Brendan McCann and that, we were all <laughs> setting it up. Um, so we set it up and then I started as a, a door haul, <laughs> you know, doing the, the door for them, you know, the tickets or whatever. And uh, when they opened up at uh, the Institute, they gave me the job um, as the uh, resident in the mellow room, the house room. <laughs> Yeah. Again, Andy Milford yeah. popped up there earlier. Um, I, I used to do it myself most of the time, but then this young lad, um, he was getting a bit more interested in house, coming out of the uh, the hardcore room, having a mooch in. And uh, <laughs> he said, can I have a play once? I said, yeah, yeah. So he brought his records, and then he used to play all the time with me. And then he went on to win a, a big competition in Mavida Corona and become a big... Uh, DJ all over the world with that. But uh, yeah, lovely lads. Wicked. Uh, uh, and you, you're saying about young, young lads, uh, Ian Ancor mentioning some some big names from the past, Martin Red, Mickey Rose, Bud, Steve Warner, uh, and, yeah. and, the, and the Shelley's connection. We, we will get that story from somebody at some point because that's, I used to go with those guys, but that's such a blank in my memory. It's insane. I, but mean, let- I only went to Shelley's once because I think um, it started... Uh, on Saturday nights, um, I think Martin started it. And, uh, yeah, Steve Warner used to play. But I used to see more of Steve and Paul Moran when they were residents at uh, Better Way. Mm-hmm. So Better Way was, um, again, Lee, Belcher, Baxter, uh, Timmy Abbott was involved from Creation Records. And they were the first ones to bring people like um, All the Boys Own Lot and uh, Flying. And uh, Danny Ramp in Oakenfold, um, Paris, like, Fabi, Fabi Paris, Fabi Paris, kind of thing. Frankie Knuckles. I remember putting a, a warehouse party on after one of them. We used to do it in down the, the bus depot in Newtown with me mate Drew, and we put that on. And like we've got Oakenfold and Terry Farley in there, and it was just it was just magic to say. Think, and then from that, then that got closed down, came on top, and that's when we went to Greens and did it there. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's funny when you were at Greens, it was myself, Dexter, Scott Bond came and did yeah, a night with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I just remember a couple of times of hairy things in there, sitting in the in the um, office with um, all the takings, and there's a fella sitting opposite in the office, and uh, you mate Sean's there skinning up. 
And uh, the fella's going, give me a draw, give me a draw. And this short's going, fuck off. But what I can see is he gave his shirts open and he's got a gun in his fucking in his thing and I'm booting Sean. Going, give, me a, <laughs> give him some. <laughs> give him some. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember another time talking again, Dev, about the, the double booking. Yeah. Well, you double booked it. Some reggae fellas come in with an axe oh, on Lord. stage and um, shouting, this is my night, this is my night, in the middle of our, our night going on. Oh, crap. Uh, so Cockney Bees just decked him. In the- <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, just uh, – and I ended up doing something. I can't – again, the dates, I can't remember. Um, I did a few things at Greens, ended up doing stuff with these um, lads from Handsworth, Glen, and uh, I didn't realise, again, that they were like um, – also gunmen, and they were like... There uh, you go, that was what? Glenn. Um, allegedly, um, allegedly, se- se- I'll say. <laughs> allegedly. Se- sorry, secu- yeah. Security. Big yeah. security, and, and, and he was the one who did all the big posters all over Birmingham. I shouldn't maybe have mentioned his name. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll edit that, I'll edit that bit. <laughs> but we I went mean... in there, like, fronting him, and he was like, he was saying, it's his night, and we were just three, like, me and Conboy and Drew, and he, I think he just liked, uh, like, we were going, who the fuck are you? And uh, so we just started doing stuff, and then it was a bit better because obviously we had his door firm before. We were just a mishmash with those who we had on the door, and it ran quite well until, um, again, Clark is then decided once because the deal was we had the door, and we had it rammed in there. He had the best bar takings he'd had, and he and still he says, wanted the well, door. He says, "I want cut of the door." It's greedy. Fuck off! We packed oh, yeah. everything in the car. He's banging on the window. Jack, where's my money? <laughs> 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 I, I, the thing is, the, the beautiful thing is that we've got so many people watching uh, intently. There's so many stories that, you know, uh, would be echoed up and down the country from the same underground scene. Because, we were, you know, it was very much an underground scene, wasn't it? And when you were from the underground yeah. scene, you're dealing with underground people. Uh, yeah. And w- when you look back on it in hindsight, you think... Boy, you know what? We were in some we were in some predicaments back then. We got into some mm-hmm. into some scrapes, and we we pulled oh, off some things as well. Oh yeah, remember, um, yeah. Sorry, Dave. Go on. No, no, no. Well, I remember back, we're, we're having the conversation. You talking, Jack? And you know, I'm trying to dig deep and remember all these different snapshots and time frames and put them in chronological order. But I remember, you know. In terms of us doing these underground parties and as such, we even did parties in these typical Winston Green, you know, these these little houses where you had to, you know, twist to go up the stairs, and we had speaker boxes stuck on the stairs, like, and, like a like a traditional blues kind of scenario. Yeah, but we're obviously we're playing house music, we're mm-hmm. playing soul, we're playing funk. You know, we've done like I said, we've done parties where literally when we were dropping the early house stuff, the early tracks and, and, and the early, you know, we could actually see the, the ceiling sort of the, bending. The, the, the floorboards are bowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, li- no, literally, you know. And um, there's a, I funny if there's a venue, um, I don't know if a lot of people can remember this, and there's a place called Beaches Road, which it was in West Bromwich, sort of out the way. And it was predominantly a, a semi- it was somebody's house, but a massive house. And it was always predominantly a reggae, a reggae venue. But because of the advent of like the house and the soul, they brought us up there. And you know, we'd absolutely ram the place out. We'd even have like traditionally um ras- you know, um guys who were into the reggae music. And as soon as I heard the early house stuff, the tracks and and you know, um Adonis stuff, they were literally jumping up and down like they were in the early days of the 70s, like the skanking and, and such. But what I'm leading up to is Jack talking and along, it's like two different scenes mm-hmm. moving alongside each other, sort of the underbelly of, of, uh, of Birmingham's club, club culture, mm-hmm. you know, and I, you guys are talking, uh, rolling off names and after the names, I'm like, I don't even know them. Man. You, you, know, you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, so, yeah. It's, so we were literally on, on the ground. Yeah. 
Tony. Yeah, on the ground, uh, Fernando Smith, uh, you, you will know Fernando, he's saying that was just around the corner. His mate's parents' house on Beaches Road, believe it or yeah. not. The Burtons uh, is the yeah. name of the family. Uh, yeah, Adam yeah. Regan's here, easy geezer. Uh, yeah. He said, uh, Jack and Conboy had a good influence on my record collection and less of a positive impact on my health in the mid-90s. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get on to that in a bit. Uh, uh, I'm just going to scroll back up, see who else has been. I said, I mentioned Steve earlier. Um, Dev, uh, Steve W here, using his wife's Facebook, he said, Maurice's night was art of noise at Jasmine's. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. And uh, you and he spun together. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all the comments. Also, Stu Partridge, easy fella. Uh, another one of my uh, good, good raving buddies from back in the day. Many, many stories that we've got to tell. Uh, so thank you guys for all the comments. I can see them whenever I get the opportunity. I will uh, mention it to the guys that we're talking to. And then uh, EDD decides to, to jump in saying, what's going on here? You just sit in the corner, mate, and just listen. <laughs> Learn something. So, uh, okay, so where did, where did we get up to? We were talking about the parallel, the timelines. Jack is just happily uh, recounting all of the, everything that's been going on. It's good, that I think, like you, you're mentioning that, Dev, because, um, you know, I always think this thing that um, yourselves, I mean, I've, I've little a few of the names, like I said before, Gary and Mark, but then there's other people who I know we're pla- do, you He's know, got like, notes. He's got notes there, you know. I told you You know, you've got like um, constructive trio, shift work, yeah. um, you know. Main attraction. Main attraction, you know. Playboy. Harry Kex, Lee yeah. and Slowey and uh, Shaquille, who was Mix Max. What was his name? Mix. Mix Wizard. Wizard. The Mix Wizard. And, Dixon, and yeah. really, there's only one person I've ever seen put this out in proper print. Greg Wilson did a really good blog about it. Um, how the, the DJs like yourselves, uh, who came from, a lot of them come from those all day scene, um, were playing house music, not just before anybody in Birmingham, but before most people in the country, before, you know, most people in Manchester, you know, like say that that crowd, the similar stuff to you, Dev, and then, yeah. you know, there's, there's that same lot from like Moss Sider with playing house music in 86, yeah. who don't get mentioned, Winston yeah. Hazel and all them from... Yeah. Um, yeah, but Sheffield, um, John Turkey, Sheffield, who've gone on to become Forge Masters. Yeah, long, long before you know. The, it, the, went, it went. Mate. I'm glad you mentioned that, Jack. London and whatever, even like Hacienda, you were yep. there. Spot on. I'm glad. You, I'm, I'm glad you said that rather than me and saying that. I've I'm always glad, said that for years. You know, when, you've, when I said you could do it tonight, because it always bugged me that yourselves and the, of the people, I'm probably missed other people out there. Apologies if I have. We're on it, and Greg Wilson, if you find his blog on it, is brilliant because yeah. he does a thing about the old days, all over, you know, Warrington, um, or all of the ones you would have been going to, playing house. And like, like my wife was saying to me, she was big in the old days and remembers going to, um, like, a night at the at, uh, the Irish Centre in, in 86, like, with Cutie, with a big fan, just house music all night. Yeah. But that was that crowd from... The old days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just I'm just chuckling here at a little bit of banter going on between Bruce and E Double D. So carry oh, on. Okay. Uh, Lee Oldham Tell jumps them to in as well. I mean, I mentioned uh, Ian Ankle and Lee Lee uh, Oldham, two uh, inseparable in the rave days. Uh, two guys that I got a hell of a lot of respect for. And God bless his big brother. Indeed, Neil. indeed, definitely. Um, Man could dance for a big fella. He definitely could. He definitely could, and we uh, we got stories for days and one of the one of the occasions i am going to get uh some of the old some of the old you know the the tales from the dance floor we'll, we'll bring the guys on and we'll just have a good chin wag like this so uh we are 54 minutes into this conversation we've got loads of people watching us live i'll repeat again if you're just passing through uh jock lee imd recounting the tales of birmingham in the mid 80s and on we're under no time constraints uh, we're just going to talk. So if you've got plans for the evening, put them aside because as you can hear, these guys have got some incredible tales and uh, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. Um, okay, that's me shutting up. Back to you guys. Yeah. Where's next? Where you what's next? Where were we yeah, at? What's next? <laughs> um, I think, like you said, Andy, there's so much, there's so much, you know, like I said, you, you, you've got to mention, um, I can tell you mad stories like... Um, Prime example, when, I mean, I was heavy, 
heavy on the on the R&B on the R&B scene. Um, uh, obviously, alongside not playing full house sets, but we just well, well, forgive my ignorance. When you say heavy on the R&B scene, just give me mm. a couple of names of artists that you would you would be talking about, just so I know what kind of style. Um, well, you talk about R and B. We're talking about the early '90s, sort of uh, 2000, sort of out and out R and B. Brandstone. Um, okay, that, that's what I was going to say. You took Mary J. Yeah. Blige, kind of Jerry, Mary J. Blige. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, you know, and you know, I mean, I was really heavy into the scene, and then I got to a certain point where E Double D. I spoke to him about this, and he can't remember. I remember. I was getting frustrated with the whole scene, with the fact that I was, because I was signed to MCA Records, so I was getting a lot of stuff sent to me as mm -hmm. promos. Um, you know I mean? Don Christie, who we were going to mention about the record shops. Mm -hmm. I mean, Don Christie used to look after me. He used to have this promo box where nobody could go in that promo box until I had first dibs. Nice. Right, nice. so I used to get a lot of promos coming through. And I'd be playing stuff to the the, the, the R and B crowd, and they'd be looking at him, looking at me like, "What are you playing? Mm. You know, what are you playing? You know." And but then I, three, but, four weeks later, they're going crazy to it. Thank you. Yeah. And I remember playing. I remember the last out and out R and B gig I did. I can't remember the exact date, but myself, E Double D, and School Schooly was playing. Mm -hmm. And I remember playing. This is when 702 just come out. This is when um, Jay Z, um, the, not the, the hustle came came. Out. All these were promos, and I, I play these. Everybody's looking at me like, "What are you playing?" You know, and I'm thinking these are gonna be classics. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I decided. I mean, there's one incident that really put me off the scene. I remember when I was playing. Schooly was there. I don't know Schooly from Adam, right? I know obviously you played with Schooly, and I remember I left my left my headphones and I was playing away. And then Schooley sort of came up and I was using his headphones and the way he just snatched, <laughs> snatched the headphones out of, out of the jack. And I'm thinking, hang on, this boy's come clean into my yard, <laughs> right? Come clean into my yard. And I was just about, I was swinging back. I was going to spark him out in the, in the DJ. This was at the, um, the system. Right. And e, e double D was in the box. I remember E double D grabbing my arm. He said he can't remember. <laughs> and then from there, I said to myself, you know something? I'm done with the R&B scene. Did, and you have, did, 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 did you ever uh, make amends with Simon? Did, no, we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't. Well, we haven't spoken since, you know. But it's just the fact that every, I'm the kind of DJ where it's a case of, I don't, whoever I am, if I'm playing the early set, I'm going to set it up. We've always been like that. Set it up nice. Set yeah. it up nice for the next DJ mm -hmm. and you set it up and you, you know, you yeah. don't play the big tunes at the start of the yeah, night. Yeah, but that, that you're talking, you, you know, you're going, you're talking from a bygone era now where you respected yeah. the night, you thought about yeah, how yeah, it, yeah, you yeah. went on. Yeah. Just got to give a name check. Uh, the legend pops into the chat, Shaquille Dixon. He says, yeah, thanks, yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you for the name check. I don't think it gets acknowledged enough how house transitioned from disco. Thank you for sharing the knowledge. Yeah. Wonderful. Legend. Okay, so so you, you you've got you touching on the 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 late nineties. Um, mm. So then <clears throat> before that, with Jock, the record label, the releases, uh, and Dev, we've got to come back to yourself and talk about the productions as well because you need you mm. need to start telling us about that. So the record labels and then the house scene, uh, Jock, the clubs then would have been started opening, Money Penny, Steering Wheel, Wobble, you know, all of those kind of things. Yeah, a little bit before, I suppose you've got like um, the first what became um, you know it's called the Balearic Network. Um, you've got a place like Most Excellent in Manchester. Uh, flying in London, Boy Zone, and uh, the first one in Brom was um, uh, Disco Dave. Did it called um, the jungle, Safari Club? The, I was going to say the Jungle the Safari Club. Yeah, yeah. Um, that then sort of closed down, and Dick took up the mantle, um, or he already was doing it because he's always been a legend. Uh, you know, from the uh, Rum Runner days, Barbarella's Dick was yeah. there, and. Uh, Again, one of the first DJs. I remember D. Uh, my mate put the shaman on. Sorry. Excuse me, I'm dying here. My mate put the shaman on at um, <coughs> Mosley Dance Centre. And uh, I don't think I'd been, even started the Umminbird then. And he asked me to play. After Dick was playing and I was kept saying to Dick, what's this record? What's that? You know, um, <coughs> just playing brilliant stuff. 
But so yeah, Dick and them started doing um, coach to not um, cake and boot de souffle and stuff. They did warehouse parties and then they started doing snobs because Nigel Blunt took it over as the manager. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a little stint over at the same time as after Safari Club at Coast to Coast with um, Phil Gifford, Steve Griffiths, yeah. and uh, Tony Clark. Uh, club, I don't think we were there too long, a few, couple of months or whatever. That fizzled out. And then me and Brucey Q started doing, carried on the Fridays. Um, and then you've, so Phil then went and started Wobble. Um, and yeah, then our other, like, so Lee and Belcher Baxter, and that started Better Way, which um, it was the originally called, was one called God's Kitchen. That was the original God's Kitchen, was them. Um, and so, yeah, that was in Snobs, in different places, and um, all that, you know, where else? Then it moved to the Institute, and that's when it got really big, you know, talking like say when they had Frankie Knuckles and all that. Dan's Factory was in there. So um, I just used to play all out. I wasn't really playing for them because, like say, uh, Paul Moran and Warner were their uh, residents. Uh, but I did play a few times for them. But then I played other things like Warehouse Parties, Cabello, for uh, Gaston <laughs> and uh, you know um, I I got, you, go, have to, you, you just have to chuckle when you think about the farce that those parties were yeah yeah I mean the very I played at the very first cream um, because uh, our, our greens had come on top so Barney so this is this is cream in Birmingham. Uh, yeah, choose the, right, the, easy and mellow. I was going to say the acronym: choose right, easy and mellow. Patrick yeah, Smooth, uh, resident Patrick DJ, Smith, and um, Andy, Andy, um, Baxter. Andy Roberts, Andy Roberts, Scott Bond. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Warner and Moran. I play the very first cream was me, Lee, and Paul Moran uh, in a little in a downstairs thing from. Barney's flat in Mosley. Uh, There's something, Jack. I can add. I can add a story to that because you know earlier I mentioned about Gilly. We yeah. used to have uh, our studio. We used to be in Ockley in the VKM building, and the guy who owned the building he was locked up for what embezzling. So we had the full run of the building. And I remember saying to Gilly, I says, "Why don't you bring Barney and Carl down here to do cream?" You know, and that's, that's when they, happened. yeah. So this is when yeah, they well, jumped from the small venues into the bigger one, yeah, bigger one, and it just exploded from there. That's right, because they used to do. Um, uh, there's a place next door to it's the Island Bar now. They were in there, and they used to do little things, and then, like you say, they went into your place. Yeah, um, but and also at the same time, Belcher and Baxter were get they were getting all the guests like Oakenfold and Ramping yeah. and all of those guests and they were playing at cream that they would bring them to play there. So that, so, I mean, I used to, I, I'm just trying to think of other, I, I just used to play all over nowhere in particular. I mean, I've just got my notes here. <laughs> so, <laughs> at you least know, you've organized with me. <laughs> well, I said to Andy, like my memory's terrible. I had to put it in notes or it would be like, uh, uh, it'd be gone. But yeah, just thought, I just used to play. I mean, even like a, I was, uh, did a, a residency on a Saturday night in Marcos for a while. Um, which was just, you know, like I say, so um, I just used to do all over the place. And then I so say we had the, we had the uh, record label and we used to do different uh, events with that. We did a big one at the Institute with um, Kevin Saunderson. It was meant to be Alison Limerick, but she couldn't do it. So we had Reese Project and big multi-room thing. Um, we used to do Boston nights all over the place. Um, uh, so that, I mean, I really enjoyed that part. And it's so that, Fizzled out because I think the you know you the Lee was getting really big with the mother and doing a lot of remixing and a lot of DJing all over the place. Uh, the lads from UB40 were getting bigger and bigger and didn't have the time for the input. So the labels just sort of fizzled out really. Um, and then I started um, doing a sort of a, well it was basically a lot hard to find um, a record uh, shop. Well, mail order mostly uh, called Lost Records with my mate Archie, um, which initially was out of his uh, in his loft, and then um, it was then moved down to um, a big place down at the airport, which was his house, and uh, we were there for a while, and then moved to the custard factory where uh, 
I met Adam, uh, he was the manager, Master Regan, earlier. And so what, what time, would? because I, I remember <clears throat> coming over and, and buying the record, so what year would that have been that you were at the farm? So the farm, we were at two points at the farm. We were there um, sort of end of 96. In 97, we moved into the custard factory. We were only in the custard factory just over a year because then they started stinging us with mad rent and right. put the rent up stupid. So um, Arch had some outbuildings, so we um, like a sort of a warehouse and we, we kitted it out and, you know, fi fixed it up. And so then, uh, so 88 to 89, 98 to 99. 98 to 99, we were back there again. So Okay. Well, I think yeah, I think it's again. the second time when I, I used to yeah. be over there regularly. Um, and someone again, mentioned earlier you know, that you that you used to I think it might have even been uh Chris Peacock. No, it wasn't Chris, Pe Chris Peacock, sorry, it was uh Brent Cross. You were saying well, it was Chris it, Peacock on there, because I used to be he used to live across the road from me. Yeah, Chris Chris was commenting earlier. Uh, yeah. yeah, Brent Cross said you used to have the stuff that you couldn't get anywhere else. So you had a good, you had a good eye for, you know, off, yeah, off the yeah, vans. Yeah, I think me and again, like Sean Conboy worked work with us. I mean, we had a really good, uh, I think, you know, we had a good taste. I mean, we used to sell some awful stuff, stuff that's now uh, becoming really popular. There's, I don't know if you remember, there's this label called Trotters that just basically uh, pumping shite. But now they're... Here they're you know they're, they're going for like twenty quid each. We used to have a lot, <laughs> but uh, on the whole, we did have a lot of good stuff and and um, a lot of rare stuff as well. You know, we used to do like again like hard to find. Um, I get, but that sort of fizzled out. Um, uh, records weren't selling as much. You know, it was, things mm -hmm. were just where start. It was start of the CDs were coming in, and people didn't need to buy a twelve pound bootleg anymore to get mm -hmm. that bridge. Well, well um, let me, let, so before we, again, I'm going to keep bouncing back between the two of you yeah, guys yeah, sure. because Devril, I didn't get, a, I didn't get a, a, an idea of you mentioned very briefly about your productions, but I'm not sure at what part of the timeline they slot into the story. Right, I'm trying, I'm trying to get things to start. I think it's about 1990. Um, got introduced to uh, a, a guy. Wow. Okay, so we jumped yeah. over that completely then. Yeah, 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 yeah. A guy uh, talking about the production, uh, Gilly. Gilly, uh -huh. Gilly, Gilly G, um, who's now fronting um, part of the UB40 setup uh -huh. touring at the moment. Um, so it was in the process of get, getting a record deal. So we put our put our lot together and we managed to get a record deal with MCA Records. So we set up the studio in the VKM building, as mentioned earlier, where Cream started their bigger, their bigger uh -huh. um, okay. adventures. And, um, you know, we did the album, missed the deadline, and we basically got shelled. Okay. You know, so carried on from there, doing sort of various sort of, sort of various different, different productions and, and, and so forth. Um, set up various labels sort of further on down the line, hip hop, started a hip hop label. This was obviously jumping the gun, but I'll come back. Um, 2000, a group, uh, Wolf Town Records, we had a group called The Villains. Okay. Um, where we released the album, I think it was something like number two UK um, best album or something, and um, international newcomers and all that sort of stuff in, in hip hop connection, you know. But then coming all the way back again, um, working with art, we worked in side projects working with artists like Kim Mazel. Um, we started working with um, Beverly Knight before she actually blew up. Um, we early days working with um, Jackie George. Mm -hmm. He's done stuff with obviously with Danny and also um, Timmy. Um, She's yeah. done stuff with Timmy and many other people as well. Yeah, yeah. So those are the sort of early, early days of of us learning learning how to do like you, you know like sort of house production and 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 sort of branch out from 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 this sort of hip hop roots and stuff. So basically, I've just been in and out of doing production, still DJing, um, touring, doing the states touring all around Europe and so forth. Um, but shortly after that, I think it's about 90, slightly after that 90, I just, like I said, I totally, I wouldn't say I fell out of love with R&B, but I just got fed up with the politics and I just basically went on to Broad Street for, I must have been on Broad Street for about, about 15 years. But then as usual, I'm not turning into Broad Street, I'm bringing IMD mm -hmm. to Broad Street. So um, I remember at one point we, we were residents at uh, Ipanema's okay. on Broad Street and we actually Did changed. Did that turn into Key Largo? 
No, 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 no. Key Largo was wasn't that further wasn't wasn't that further up. I think it turned into something something else. But we went in there with our own brand of 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 funk, Latin music, salsa music. But we did, you know, we weren't going to bend to anybody. We did it our own mm-hmm. way. And then, I mean, up to a certain point, we were headhunted by every single manager on Broad Street wanted us to to basically jack in if a name was to come down to their gaff. Right. You know. Um, and then did a stint and finally ended up at, uh, at actually we started, I've got to mention this with Bruce, we started um, a night at uh, Ipanema's, which, uh, which is uh, probably the early prototype of uh, liquid fusion. Mm-hmm. And then that was going for about, about I'd say about four or five months. So and, it's just closer know, to the Hyatt? Yeah, well, m- middle mm-hmm. okay. from the, from, you could say where, um, Revolution is right. and the Hyatt. It was sort of slap bang in the middle. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so we started a prototype of um, uh, uh, liquid fusion, and then we took it up until. Okay, we track it. Most successful club nights in terms of from the from the let's say soul perspective. Not one started where, for example, if for example, if Jock put a night on, you guarantee that place is going to be ram. From once he's put those flyers out, the first night is going to be ram. Whereas a lot of the legendary soul nights, they've always been slow burners. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can, I can read off Branston's. You know, that was a that Branston soul night. That was like a, a Sunday um, beer and fag night, you know, you know, mm-hmm. going down to the local social club and having a cup of beer and fag. And then one and two dribs and drabs, one or two of the dancers started coming in. Bruce is just giving you props for remembering the name of Ipanema's because he went out clean out his head. <laughs> <laughs> Dementia. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> and um, and then they just grew into, in, into, into these legendary nights. You know, mm. every single night from... I don't want to say the word a black perspective, mm-hmm. but I've said it, right? Yeah, no, they've no, always well, I think been, it, it's relevant. They've, they've always been slow burners, but once they pick up steam, they become legend, legendary knights. I, I'm you know, quite Bruce envious. Did. I'm quite envious that I, I, I wasn't at any of these events, but I was already busy. I was fully immersed in my thing, doing what I was yeah. doing, you know, yeah. at residencies. Yeah. But listening to this, you know, it's yeah. uh, And, you know, part of the irony as well is, is as, as what you've just mentioned, when the house scene went full blown, even though I was playing house and, and, and stuff, I had to make a choice whether I wanted to be out and out Carl Cox or do I want to stay with my soul and my funk, mm-hmm. you know? So when the rave scene went absolutely supernova, I had to make a conscious decision. Do I want to stay true to me or do I want to cash follow, in. cash in, yeah. you know? Cause I mean, with myself, I, I suppose I'm one of the DJs that was from the early days very unusual in the fact that I was disciplined in doing running mixes. Mm-hmm. As in, you remember Tony DeVitt? Yeah, I used to listen to him religiously on the radio when I was a, when, when I was a youngster because he was he was the king mm-hmm. of mixing. And and the other side of it was scratch mixing, where now you know anybody you know you can scratch me, but I'm talking about the days when. You added little glimpses of buffalo gals or something where you had to basically teach yourself uh-huh. how to do it. So I had the discipline of being able to do running mixes as well as doing all the usual fancy spin rounds, scratching with your nose and your mm-hmm. elbow and all that stuff. The kind of you know? the, the kind of thing that E Double D wishes he could do. He's cussing me here on the screen. He's he's cussing yeah. me on the screen, but he forgets. <laughs> I'm the one in front of the camera. I'm the one yeah. with the microphone. So hush your nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I feel compelled to say again, just for you guys, uh, chewing the fat, remembering great times. I'm, I'm happy that so many people are still enjoying the stories. Feel free to uh, interject at any point in the in the comments, guys. Um, so, uh, yes, Jock, Devril. Uh, let's continue with the story then. Turn to the 2000s. Um, you know, the, the the Broad Street's a completely different uh, monster now. And uh, Actually, the, the, part, totally the part is a difference. You've got, you've got yeah. I remember Jock, we used to have incredible evenings down at the um, Arcadian in the, uh, I can't think of the name of yeah, the bar. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, you, so you're going back to, 
Um, yeah, so after finishing the um, the record shop, um, I then set up, well, myself, uh, Lee Fisher and uh, Austin Kilburn, who was uh, an engineer for UB40, set up uh, another label called Fabric, which um, we had to change the name for legal reasons, even though we had it trademarked, but they were... Uh, we couldn't really afford to take them on in court, so we had a little settlement and uh, changed it to further. Um, but, yeah, so we moved into a studio office in Warstone Lane, which I think you were talking about, Dev, where uh, Danny was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, So Danny Kane and uh, Nick Colgan and yeah. Jim Brown uh, were a band or a collective called uh, Star Company. Yes. They had that and Danny had his studio yeah. down there. I think Gilly used to go on tour with them as well. Yeah. And uh, so we had that. And what we, so we started doing uh, Sundays at Sober, which was called Music for Bars. I think you played, Andy. I'm sure uh, Andy Baxter did. Um, you know, uh, myself, Lee, Smoothie. Nick, Danny, Smoothie, Leroy Hussey. So a big collective of us just used to just, there was no money in it. We just used to. It was just come play, and we used to, you know, enjoy. and then I think what you all were, were um, sort of hinting about there was that we, then we used to have lots of most Sundays a bit of an afters in uh, Nick and Danny's place and uh, uh, carnage, carnage, and uh, mm. where you know I used to be um, used to think of that iron side out of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's no there's no point trying to tell that story because nobody's going to get it it's one of those you had to be there times yeah, so we used to race people in a chair down the, the car but anyway so that was that and then um as you were saying things they were getting a bit commercial weren't they um all over yeah. the place um, i think the underground bubble sort of burst then didn't it you it, know it, it had, yeah i mean it was got quite it had become pretty big all over yeah um, so in the end of 2000, we um, put on uh, a warehouse party called Boston in mm. that building. Yeah. And I remember the night on the, on, it was New Year's Eve 2000, uh, we were digging snow off the roof and it was just, well, Danny, who was... Was that the one with DJ Falcon? No, no, that gets on to that. This is in, okay. in the uh, Warstone Lane where they first, we started the, the Boston parties. Okay. Um we um yeah and we, so we, we did a few there and uh we did uh one in a sex dungeon down at the bottom of uh <laughs> uh constitution hill where yeah. Stephen graham the actor who's trying to get in but the, the owners wouldn't let him in and and uh we did a few you know, boat parties and uh have, then we'd have afters at sober and then whatever mm -hmm. And, uh, so I'm going to, yeah. I am going to be talking to Danny in a few weeks as well. So yeah. he, he'll be he'll be able to 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 go deeper into this. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, we we, we then um, so we did a big thing down at the custard factory with Robert Owens, multi thing, and um, I think it might have been a mistake of ours. This we then went from doing things like that and warehouse parties and all these things to thinking we could do a weekly club. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, Sid Owen, who has the um, which was what was it, steering, steering wheel. wheel. Yeah. Steering well, at the time, yeah. before it became bamboo, he was like tinkering around with what to do with it. And uh, we we set up and we were like sort of partners in it with him to set up this club called Air, which was before Air, they took the name and took it up to whatever God's Kitchen was. But um, he was an absolute nightmare to work with, Sid was. You know, he had, he had like this big thing in the middle where there used to be like a booth for people to dine. And he was going, ah, geez, no, you're not taking that down. It's a lovely bit of wood, you know. Right? <laughs> mm. So it didn't work. We, we did have DJ Falcon on there. We had the boys own lot on and a few, you know. So but it didn't work because of them. And I, I think um, we did one last warehouse one up at um, the lap dancing place on... Uh, where was it on Broad Street with Barney? And I think it just sort of, we just fizzled out then from doing the Boston things. Mm -hmm. Nick and Danny went on to do um, some things and then Danny went on to do If at Bushwhackers. Mm -hmm. um, and we um, then started doing some bits. We had a 
Labour Party for uh, further down at the boiler room. Um, I'd been playing down there a few times and did a few for other people and then started doing a night, excuse me, which was called Spank, which was like, you know, if you've ever been in London and you see them little cards with the, uh, hmm. the you know, get the extra services. Don't, that don't know there. what you're talking about. Yeah, so I'm not saying you've used them, but I'm saying you must have seen the cards. So Never seen them either. Based on that and I went all over Brom putting them in there. And I got, um, I'm just, I'm looking around the studio to see if I've got any lying around. Yeah. I got, I got a uh, nicked putting them in and got a fine for, um, you know, for putting uh, illegal flyers up and stuff. But uh, that quickly, we moved it quickly to, we became further education and um, then further. And so I did that. That was myself and Lee again. Um, Matt McKillop joined us then. Um, you know, he's a, uh, he was he was a whiz at getting on the promotions. He was unbelievable. And uh, Paul Kaminsky, who I used to DJ with before, um, in sort of uh, a couple of years before, we did a bar called Ink Bar, uh, which was like a champagne bar in the um, in the Arcadian. But it was unbelievable. It was like you know where other people were paying you like I don't know hundred quid for a, to play, they were paying us like two hundred and fifty quid. And uh, I think Smoothie played one New Year's Eve for us down there. And, uh, but then he found, found out the bloke who was running it, I won't say his name, but uh, it was all a big money laundering thing, a huge <laughs> multi-million pound money laundering. Right. So, um, yeah, so Kaminsky joined us. And so the four of us used to do that. And we had um, we ran it down there for, for a, a couple of years. Um, it was like, but I'd say it's one of my favourite ever clubs in Brom the Board. I, I won't. Um, I'll just very briefly interrupt you and say Gifford's with us, saying uh, a big, uh, giving a, a, a an OK sign to the Warston Lane venue and below with Key Key as well. That, that's right. Yeah. So after I think out a bit after our time, um, uh, Below did a few things down there. I went to one. I think it was our um, Below did because uh, Danny started working with them, and I went to a couple of the really good parties. Um, Ivan Schmag, I think I went to. Mm-hmm. which is um or Errol Alkin, I can't remember. But yeah, there, there was good parties down there. Well, I, I think we're, we're starting to now get into a really full um, documenting party by party, week by week, um, <laughs> scene by scene. Uh, again, I'm going to say we're under no time constraints, but uh, keen to also at the same time move it on uh, and find out about your th- feel how your feelings are uh, Devril, particularly, haven't heard mm-hmm. from you in a while. Um, how the scene progressed then, and you know, the, the change in the scene around the same time that Jock's been talking about what was going on for yeah. you. Did you totally move away from the uh, from the music? Um, well, as as Jock mentioned, I mean, around that period, that's when. Um, can remember everything prior to that, whether it's left field or right, it was very much underground. And then all of a sudden, you know, the clubs, you know, um, the media, they sort of cut and done, um, all of a sudden, cha-ching. Mm-hmm. This is when, if you can, if you think about it, this is where the advent of the, the, you know, these super DJs started to sort of pop up and and the whole thing was basically, in, in a nutshell, hijacked and it was commercialised. So I think that was a sort of a black area where we were sort of, either you, you go with what's happening or you sort of scratch around trying to create something which is you or, but to, in all honesty, that period that went on before, you know, it, it, it come and it, and it had gone, but mm-hmm. everything had become so saturated to the point where you couldn't, you felt as if you were in a straight jacket, mm-hmm. unless you went to, you know, um, you got to the level of the Ministry of Sounds and, you know, that sort of clubbing mm-hmm. level. But all, all, all the way along, all, all of these stories that we hear about from so many mm-hmm. people, Mm-hmm. What I always try and, and remind myself is, and the people mm-hmm. who are talking, so many names, so many different venues, so many different eras, we're still talking about a, predominantly, and correct me if I'm wrong, a core mm-hmm. group of however many hundred of people it is following mm-hmm. you along the way, wasn't it? So it's still yeah, yeah, very, yeah, yeah. very small I mean? scene still in, in both our circuits. Yeah, yeah. You know, because that, it's, it's almost semi incestuous in the sense where clubs I play that play in a different format. You play at the clubs. You know, as, as Jock mentioned before, I remember things like um, one of the main clubs, well, bars people used to meet up was Notes. You know, the bars like that have gone now, but that Notes was the main bar 
where no matter whatever scene you were from, mm -hmm. everybody made up notes and then you'd go off to your wherever you were going for, for, for that particular night. I don't know if you remember where notes was where um, it was opposite. I remember notes. I used to play there yeah. regularly on a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and that was, a, and, and that was, and that was a major, that was a major, major venue in terms of pre, pre club bar, mm -hmm. you know, even things like, um, you see, I'm copying Jot now, I'm putting notes down. Um, well, it's best you know. also, with our uh, Haddle Brightons, you have to have yeah. everything keep me notes. Like Feinstein's on um, on um, New Street. I can't think of that. Yeah, okay. that was like a that was like a club above. I can't remember what it was. I think it's like a um, building society downstairs, but it was like a club upstairs. And that mm. used to be like a regular sort of midweek club for if you want to listen to your soul funk or, oh. or uh, you know and stuff. And another one as well was uh, Trizine's. Yeah. Because because I remember playing with um, Sasha before he you know before he went supernova mm -hmm. you know so a lot of djs were cutting their teeth in brum mr gifford was telling us stories about trezines uh yeah uh, th I th th thursday nights yeah. i think he was talking so that was some dick's not on a thursday yeah yeah, yeah. He, was, he was talking about the louis vega um uh, it, um incident uh hawkins is, was another really famous wine bar wasn't yeah it? Yeah. That was a big one on the Sundays, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That you, I remember there was a, a, a period for myself. It's like you couldn't get in, couldn't get in, couldn't get in. It's like every yeah, week yeah. then, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Yeah. And also um, the, what's it called? The rep bar on a Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, that was another yeah. big one as well. Is the the rep bars the one in, within the library complex? Is that right? Or no, no, yeah. no. That's or is it, it, where was Raphael's? Where was Raphael's? Was in the library. That's no, the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. No, Rep Bar is in the theatre. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. you're right. Yeah. Alexander, yeah. is it? Raphael's, Patrick oh, the and Rep I. the theatre, yeah. Yeah, Raphael's, Patrick and I had a residency in Raphael's on a Friday. We used to do yeah. alternate uh, Sundays. And then uh, Phil saying about Rep Bar uh, Sundays. But, you know, we're reminiscing. So <clears throat> where where does that leave us then in regards to as, as time progressed and... and you know, how, how things are. Actually, Ian Ancorn asked a question. I'm going to give you the question, but I don't think you're going to be able to answer it. Uh, he'd be interested to know who you feel had the busy, biggest success or who left the biggest mark from a Birmingham perspective to a more national or wider perspective because we've yeah. had some big hitters. So We're immediately, DJ wise. Yeah, immediately people that spring to mind for myself would be uh, yeah. Scott, Scott Bunn, not me, Scott Bunn, Steve Lawler. <laughs> Lawler, right. you know. Lawler, I say in terms of superstar DJ thing, Lawler, mm -hmm. yourself with the Soul Central at the time, you know, yeah. you, were, you, were, you were rolling yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I would as far <laughs> miles apart from someone like Steve Lawler, but I'll take no, that. No, Thank you. You know, that, you know, with you were big and different, maybe you know, with Soul Evan and the Ministry and all that. Yeah. You know. You know Miami, as I was, well, I was going to come back on to, I forgot about that. Uh, um, well, my first trip to the, well, the only trip to <laughs> one Miami. Legendary. Uh, Legendary. Yeah. I've been um, yeah, introducing me to uh, Pina Coladas for the first time, which I still enjoy now. <laughs> um, but the bit that reminds me back of that is that um, we had that record, Music in the Sound by Nowhere Men. Mm -hmm. that we took out there we were punching around because i was uh, meeting quite a few people like italian beanie and martini people like that that was talking to and uh of all things like we were walking back from somewhere i think it was um might have been a playboy party or something because smoothie used to get us got us into everywhere didn't they you know and uh we were coming back from some party and uh danny kane's gone hold on give us one of them them records jock so he took one of the records, gone into some burger bar and he's given the record to Tony Humphreys and uh, he just left it at that. And then the next night was Magic Sessions, which I, I never went to, me and Nick stayed in. But we dropped, I think you went, uh, Patrick and that, and uh, he dropped it as, and like it made it his tune of the uh, of the conference. Mm. So just one of them. Wow. <laughs> and then from that, we got loads of people looking to license it. So it was 
Yeah. Brilliant. I've got uh, Kevin uh, Casey Jones from Birmingham, who's recently moved to not far from here, uh, where I am now on the Costa Blanca. I met him uh, last week. He says, don't forget me at the Rat, at the Rat and Parrot playing R&B in the late 90s. So uh, wow. shouts out, Casey. Um, okay, so back, back, back to you then, guys. We, we were talking about... Uh, I asked the question and I, and I got sidetracked. So you said Steve, you said Steve Lawler, uh, Devril, mm. yourself. Who would you say would had a, a big impact nationally or internationally? Um, to be honest, I, uh, if you're talking from the sort of dance side of stuff, I'd probably say I, I, I'd probably pull pull a blank. To be honest, because mm-hmm. my well, head no, was... well, no, the scenes that you know, people yeah. who, who within your circuit. You know, um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned it earlier on, okay. you mentioned someone like Goldie, for example, you know, not yeah, yeah. Birmingham, Wolverhampton, but still. Wolverhampton, right. Yeah. Okay, another way I can rephrase that um, is you've always, we spoke about this off, um, off, off camera in terms of you always pass the baton. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you've heard of um, um, the um, Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, where, you know, you do 10,000 hour work you know you do ten thousand hours and it's almost like a cross where opportunity knocks okay so you have a certain djs where they've been playing a trade door slammed in their faces they're ready they're hungry they're raw you pass the button you know like for example a name i could mention e double d example oh you can't i can't believe it literally as you said that he comments he better mention me Ah, oh, you couldn't have timed that any better. Hey, I, I wanted that money, you know. Anyway, yeah, and um, yeah, you know, it's just, just, just pass, passing that baton. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm saying this from the heart. This is me. You know, I've always put myself or people like Double D and people like, uh, other DJs like yourself, and we're not just DJs. We're in a sense ambassadors mm-hmm. for Birmingham. You know, because I can give you instances where I've DJed in London, and they automatically assume I'm a London DJ. Because they say, oh, you, 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 you're, you're wicked. And, and, and as soon as I find out I'm from Birmingham, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you're from Birmingham. You know, so every time I've stepped out, I've always tried to represent Birmingham. But then coming back to what you mentioned before, it's in terms of passing the baton, mm-hmm. you know, and then somebody else runs with it. It's not about ego. It's, not, it's, it's just basically keeping Birmingham ticking over. Mm-hmm. Even you could even add people like um, Bruce Q. You know, there's been particular nights where it's we've had this bit of lulls and then it's kicked off and then we've had a night. So Bruce had his um, um he had his nights at the living room, and then from there he went over to the living room. I mean to to Zinc, and then from Zinc went down to the um, Arcadian, Poppy Red, and then obviously we, then 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 Deep took over, and then you had Brock up. So it, it, as you as you, we have these little lulls, but we sort of tend to move on and other players take up the baton and we generally 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 move with it mm-hmm. you know but in terms of um like it says djs as such if anything um it's more a movement now a collective because yeah. as you know you can't do it mm. you can't do it on your own you know um as you know most bars and clubs are very finical in terms of they it's, it's just like social media they want instant numbers they want in, instant impact mm-hmm. but when you take it on the level where we took on the back burner where it's just a collective as mm-hmm. Jack mentioned before friends coming together doing what you love you know rather than turning it into a, in, in, in a DJ job I've been there where I've, yeah. I've DJed literally professionally you know um, 10 15 years you know that was my bread and butter you know as, as anything else it ends up becoming just a job yeah, yeah. and then and- you try and bring that back your attitude is is a really is a really great positive uh inspirational attitude not everyone has that same outlook unfortunately mm. and you you do spot those along the way jock you you want to say something because i say yeah, that. yeah i just want to pick up there dev you know when you were doing it like you're saying and that's like a job in and out um mm. you're doing these bars and especially when you're in places like um in you know broad street or whatever where the crowd you know, like you say, you're playing Latin and stuff like that, and they're coming up asking you for Britney Spears. Mm. And it's just like, did it get to a point where you like, you become disillusioned with it because that's what you're doing all the time, and it's and it's not. Um, you know, you know, in all honesty, you know what it basically boils down to. 
it's not so much for want of a better word the punters themselves because we like i says we went in there we we dictated you know this was us a lot of the tunes you can go broad street now and they rinse them out we were the ones that introduced them onto broad street but the biggest problem would be it's some manager in the bar where he's got yeah. his own concept where he wants you to turn it into something else or i can give a prime example when I remember playing at uh, Ipanema's had a new area manager come in and the place was absolutely rocking. And the area manager turned over to one of the bar staff and, t and told her to tell me to, to change because I was playing a bit of R&B. Because, you know, we weren't stupid. We touched on it, then we moved on. And he actually told her um, to change the music, but he didn't say it in that way. He, he told her, tell him to change that black shit. Mm. Road straight again, though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. So that was one of the catalysts. Well, in the end, obviously, I went to I went to Zinc, um, but then that's that's where it sort of died in terms of um, at Ipanema's. But then I'm, what I'm trying to say is, we're always playing that battle between playing how you really want to play and then putting on your your commercial end. And then we've all as DJs, we've all been there where hit, hit, to, hitting the numbers and pleasing the crowd, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what, yeah. what I was sitting on it there is because there was a period of time when that's what I did. It was like a work, you know, maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday, even Sundays. Yeah. That's what, you know, as well as running the record label or whatever. Yeah. And uh, when working with Matt McKillop, because he was, the, he was the whiz at getting us into the places. And uh, yeah. so, you know, we had the resident down at um, Panama, which was, you know, down, it's, it's off Broad Street, down the bottom. Canal, down the there. Canal Street. Yeah, yeah. Bob, Bobby Fuel Brands. Bobby, Bobby Brands. Brands. Yeah, we were in yeah. there. So, and we'd be in there, Tiger, Tiger at the same time. Because we had a little management thing, me and him, called Future Music. So he would, he because he was brilliant at networking, he'd get like, you know, 10 bars with one of us. And then we'd we'd have enough D between us. You know, Paul D and you say, we'd have all, um, you know, Junior. So we'd have people we'd put in these, these just to give our mates and get ourselves work really not really taking like management money you know so but again you know doing that say like that where you're just playing like a lot of really great like great um stuff like say you know for an example Gwen McCray all this love loved it but then when you're playing it three times a weekend for like five years it's just like and I think yeah. I got I got a bit disillusioned and I just thought I've, I've had enough of this yeah, until a bit later on to when I went to first time I went to Croatia, and uh, that, I got the love back. But it just I was just because it's it's, the, it, it, it is dem, it's demoralising, isn't it? I had yeah. I had the same uh, period where starting off playing UK Garage in Birmingham, you know, and and mm -hmm. and rocking it uh, in Key Largo on on a Friday night after my radio show, yeah, playing the most underground amazing music, fantastic, and then skip forward however long it was, I can't remember. Um, and just having people stood there with their arms folded, looking at yeah. me going, when are they going to play uh, Sweet Like Chocolate? You know, and it's just like, well, I've been killing this music for so long, breaking this new music, and now you just want to hear all of these tunes. And it's just, you do get to that point, don't you? But anyway, yeah. that, that that's uh, that's my story. I'm not here to tell my story. I'm here to listen no, to yours. No, no, you're, 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 you're part of the mix, Andy. You're part mm. of the mix. That's what I'm saying. It's like, it's it's... Um, I think unless you're playing, you know, at certain, you know, uh, in clubs and it's just how you want it, which we, you know, as a lot of us as working DJs, it wasn't there. Like you say, if you're doing work and it's well, better than better than a day job, it's yeah, so, a bit, a bit you know, than eight hours. Then, you know, um, it's it still takes away a bit of the love, I think, and it did for me. Well, let's um, get let's get back, back to some let's back. get back to some philosophizing. Uh, I got all that out in one go. Then uh, towards the back end, are there any key moments that we haven't covered in the story that you that we 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 should get to? Um, I mean, here we are at twenty twenty two. A hundred percent guarantee. As soon as we come off air, we're going to remember this. Name, it happens. That name, it, that it, happen, yeah. it happens all the time. But what I will say is, and yeah. you know, we're, I'm not rounding up. We're still chatting. Mm -hmm. I'll get you guys back on. I'll mix you up with someone uh, because you're all going to, you know, maybe yourself and Bruce can come on Devril or, or, or I know Jock would be incredible. Jock and uh, Jock and Lee or Danny's going to be coming on in a few weeks. Adam, mm -hmm. Phil will come back on uh, and we can even have more of us all talking together mm -hmm. because 
once we get the the timeline concreted because every mm-hmm. you know we've pretty much told this story so many times it is mm-hmm. good to have the interaction between people because there are things that you say you know i didn't mention this and remember that and yeah. different things that bounce on so from a from a uh, a key moment point of view jock i know particularly because you're still very current in what's going on so, i mean going back there's a couple of key moments back at the hummingbird that i've I mean, firstly, about how it was, came across. I mean, if you ever met my mate Miles, you would never believe that without him, that club wouldn't exist. It's, um, you know, if people just can't believe that that's... So, I mean, that's why I wouldn't say mention about him with that. Um, remember the sticky the, carpet. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and, and the other one from in in there, it was it was quite a key part. There was... Um, I've always been a fan of the Happy Mondays, you know, followed them round from... First seeing them in 1986 at the Tower Ballroom, and again because I was an indie kid, that was they were sort of uh, again a lot of indie kids were sort of getting into dance music through them, another you know through the mixes that were getting done, um, and I, I played me and Sean Conboy uh, DJed for them at the um, which I think was one of the first times at a big gig that big where they um, had DJs playing house music before them. And uh, they then went on to do that big and big shows with with Paul Oakenfold, and so I'm not saying we, we should. Have, you are, Jack. That's exactly what you're saying. <laughs> what I'm yeah. saying about that <laughs> night is, I've been and it's been told to me by numerous people um, who indie kids were at that uh, gig, um, and they heard. So we were just playing all the Hummingbird House stuff uh, before the gig, and they said that was the first time they'd heard house music. And then the next week they were at the Snapper Club. That was it that changed. So for them, that for me, it's a pivotal thing for, to play for that band. And then for them, people, for them, people have told me over the years that that part changed their lives in terms of music because then they that set them on the path to being clubbers. Yeah. So that was one of the old ones I wanted to. to you know, with. ironically, you mentioned the um, um, the hummingbird. I can remember with the sound system tough groove. Um, I know we supported, who was it, um, uh, Public Enemy twice when they came. Yeah. EPMD, um, Stetsasonic. I'm trying to think who else. Did we you support? did De La Soul. And we did De La Soul that as well. So day. most of the hip-hop crews that ca- actually came on tour to the UK, they always ended up at the Omnibird and we we always supported them, um, obviously DJ and so on. So, you know, I mean, you've mentioned, uh, we both mentioned the Omnibird, so... In, in essence, the Hummingbird is probably one of Birmingham's unsung heroes, mm-hmm. even though it was, it was a bit it's haphazard. Very, very much revered amongst many of us, yeah. though. Shaquille's asking, yeah. who would you say was the best promoter or club that you worked for? And you've probably maybe answered the question there, you know, as, as far as influence. For me, for the club, it would have to be Hummingbird. That was it for me. Mm-hmm. That was... Um, you know, it, it, Mr. Blake gave us a, a break two kids he'd never heard of, mm. and it changed my, him giving us that break changed my life. It changed all. It did it actually change all our lives. I say it a lot. You yeah. know, with with the event that and, I do um, now, people say to me, "Oh, it's you know, it's, it's changed our lives." But that those times, right place, right time, Jock. Yeah, but you, I mean, you've embedded was, yourselves in our memories. Yeah, I was at the mo- at that time studying to be like um, a site manager, quantity surveyor. And uh, I was working and getting paid. He was, I was getting paid the same money as I'd work in a week. So I ditched that, that, that life and and uh, got. I mean, we used to give like so get, at the time getting paid more than people like Sasha and that. So you know, it, I've got to give 100% respect and props to Mr. Blake. Mm-hmm. So for me, that would be it was that yeah because it changed my life really. Cool. And therefore. Yeah. Yeah, um, I could mention various. I mean, like I could mention like self eternity Lucas and his, Lucas and his brother, you know, because they took to the the you know the whole R and B thing up to up to the next level. But then coming full circle, um, if you want to talk about um, promoters or uh, uh, allowing us to have a, a platform, a venue, it was definitely definitely Hummingbird. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, because I mean, it's it's like the amount of things you had there and did, and the amount of things we did there, and I can remember all these different promoters um, getting involved, doing all days at the Hummingbird. And where could you find that in, in the city centre? Because I know firsthand, this, the, the whole clubbing thing, it was a syndicate. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you were in, if you're independent, they more or less dictated who could step in and who could step out of, of, of Birmingham. You know, they were like the, like like the nightclub mafia, and the only people mm-hmm. they couldn't couldn't mess around with people like First Leisure, all the bigger boys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All independent. If you were totally independent on your own, you're stuffed. You know, you try and put a night on, they'd stop your night. But the Omin Bird, they were a totally different entity. Well, he didn't stand any nonsense. I mean, one another thing I've got a massive respect for him. Um, he, he, he was getting some, they wanted to close him down because of um, the PRS were off, the, like, you know, hounding him. Yeah. And uh, at the time, sort of, you know, you're talking end of the 80s, um, he, he stood his ground, Mr. Blake, yeah. and said, um, you show me what black artists get paid out of our money. Yeah, yeah. I'll pay you, and then I'll pay you. He says, because yeah. I'm not giving you the money to yeah. give to Elton John. <laughs> yeah, you know, that was just a smoke screen, just just, yeah. just, just, to shut him down. That was just a back door. Yeah, that was it. It was that, you know, they did all sorts, like I say, because he had public enemy, they would have shut him down for that in it. And, um, you know, it's, yeah. Incredible, incredible. Well, gentlemen, <clears throat> an hour and 45 minutes we've been here wow. talking and we've still got so many more tales so many more stories to tell bruce he's <laughs> saying i'd love to join in with dev and jock and take our tesco chats to a next level so that's mm-hmm. some private joke there i'm not sure um uh so jock very briefly what's going on in your world now um at the moment um so a few years ago, I set up with my mate Jenny Greaves an organisation called Rave Against Racism, and uh, basically to raise awareness within the music industry, a bit like Rock Against Racism was, mm-hmm. uh, but well, on a you know, club, it can be all types of anything to do with clubbing. Um, so um, hopefully, we can. I'm trying to get some more. We've been doing gigs over the years and uh, raising money in homeless uh, in Birmingham. I think we've got, um, I've got one there, I can't remember. Benefits gig, it's called, a band called Benefits at the Hounds on the 21st of Feb, which is, um, again, for Brave Against Racism, raising money for homeless in Birmingham. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm resident at, uh, well, it was Digworth Dining Club, and now it's um, Hockey Social, so I'm doing that. Um, still do bits and bobs at the uh, Hair and Hounds with Adam Regan's place. He has me on. Um, I do different things there because we started a night there called um, House Sound of Birmingham, myself and Lee, and we've had people like um, Marshall Jefferson and a guy called Gerald Nightmares and Wax Morris Fulton, uh, boys, you know, Farley and Heller, do that there. Some, and uh, so, yeah, doing that, I've... Hummingbird Just, reunion, a, a couple of hummingbird reunions. Oh, yeah, we've reunion done a few hummingbird past. reunions. So uh, 2013, the building reopened as the ballroom. Um, so I went and spoke to them, and we did a couple of reunions, 2013, 2014, and uh, we did it there. Then we've had um, one, which was the 30 years of the hummingbird, and I think we did that one at Alfie Birds in the Custard Factory with Wobble. Mm-hmm. And then we did one 2019, another one which was in uh, Spotlight and Mama Roos. Um, maybe we'll leave it with the Hummingbird Reunion, which would only be next year, in fact, 35 years of the Hummingbird. Because if you take 88, because it's me and Lee, mm-hmm. hypnosis was 88. Next year would be 35 years. Um, a hummingbird reopened as the forum it looks wicked in there, brilliant. So maybe we could do a little one in there. Um, so carry on with, the, with doing those um, house center Birmingham things. Um, I do a radio show, which we've been doing about four years now, uh, called Electric Soup uh, on Brum Radio. And I also do another one, ending back to my indie past, called Teenage Kicks with Sean uh, Conboy. I've been doing it for about two years, so that gets every Thursday night. I do that still. And um, just before the lockdown, I set up another organisation called House for Homeless, which has sort of been shelved that I'm just trying to get back up and running. And the idea by that is um, is to put on events around the country. Well, it could be worldwide anywhere, really, once it gets rolling. 
I just need to get some uh, get behind it and start pushing it. And the idea of that is you put on events, cities anywhere, and the money raised will go um, split in a certain, but like a chunk of it will go to local grassroots homeless organisations. Because uh, I, I ran a homeless uh, group here, got part of it for about five years. So um, there are a lot of things that go on. There's one at the moment on for crisis and shelter, all fantastic, but they're big organisations and it's the little people who need. So I've got the plan to do a couple up in Manchester with um, uh, Chris Massey at the, at the Carlton Club and uh, Luke Unabomber and stuff. So hopefully we're doing that in the summer. More Rave Against Racism's up there. I do Rave Against Racism at Audio Farm Festival. Um, so that's where I'm at the moment. I'm out of breath just listening to that, mate. I know. <laughs> incredible, incredible noble causes. <laughs> Fair play to you. And I'm... Uh, We'll, we'll I'll be sure to share some links to um, some of those things in the in the comments as well as uh, artworks where people may be able to get hold of the t-shirts if you've got any around. So, uh, Devril, yourself, it would be um, it would be pretty daft of me to ask if you're still into music, looking at the tardies behind you. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, up until the uh, well, the pandemic, I, um, you know, a lot of gigs got sort of cancelled, so. Ironically, I did. Um, I played at uh, Brook Up. I think it was about two, three weeks ago, and that was for my first gig. You know, well over a year. Mm -hmm. Is that you, know, head? you know, yeah, yeah. It got got behind the decks, nervous as hell. You know, because you know, you know. But then once you're behind the decks, all that experience sort of just 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 kicked in. But to be honest, my main directive is uh, I've just been in the studio, um, just doing production in terms of doing a lot of soulful house stuff, a lot of broken stuff, and a lot of sort of. Um, experimental sort of uh, neo soul sort of uh, uh, jazzy stuff. Does he get um, to see the light of day? Well, the, and this is a problem because the missus gives me stick. She says, you're making all that noise up there. We had seen no end <laughs> result, you know, but, um, but I says, I says, it's like a fine wine, you know, mm. and as you know, the, how, the, how the industry works, you know, it's not point me doing being a one hit wonder, you know, I'm see, trying yeah. to create a particular sound. So hopefully, um, I put some stuff on SoundCloud, uh, um, so hopefully this year I'm going to start dropping certain nuggets, and and also on top of that as well, there's certain tracks where you know uh, you've done production, Andy, where you can hear vocals. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be linking up with certain vocalists and and start doing clubs and doing certain projects, and then basically pushing them out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, basically I'm just going to do the numbers game. You know, like. The spaghetti you just stick That's it, this, it. throw it at the wall and, and see what sticks well for yeah. someone who shies away from the limelight e -double -D has got so much to say in this chat i would love to bring him on for one of these conversations but the, man's the video a, mm. the man's such a fool he won't have his photo taken he won't be in front of yeah. the camera how are you going to tell your story you nubbed if we can't get you on the screen right yeah. i cost you out live to everybody fix yeah. up would you agree yeah i agree the, i second go. that because well, okay. I've known so, E Double D from when he was like 14, 15. And we even went on, we used to be on them. It'll back this up. We used to be on, it's a Kiss FM, it's a pirate station in Brum. And we used to have this, these running jokes and slate, slating each other off on, 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 on air and stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, it's, you know, it's, I've seen him from a kid develop into, you know, into this into this entity who won't have his picture taken. I know. But anyway, let's not talk about him anymore because he's big up his mm. head. So, mm. uh, gentlemen, definitely been uh, incredibly entertaining, very, very interesting. We've been just inundated with comments throughout. When you, you'll be able to look back and see all of the comments that people have been leaving, you can see a lot of the names, people who have loved it. Uh, my friend from uh, Wales was there. Shout out, Damo. Thank you, my friend, for, for passing through as well. Uh, and we will definitely bring you back on with some of the other guys because there's still so much of the story to be told. You've definitely helped to put Birmingham on the map. Uh, you are uh, legends within your own right. You're definitely um, legends in my mind. And I know that without you guys, uh, you know, we wouldn't have so much in the second city. So I, I salute you and I say thank you very much indeed. And thank you for giving me your time tonight. Thank you for giving us the platform. Well, thanks for having us on. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. I mean, no I'm... problem. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, I'll uh, press a button and it's going to boot you out my Zoom. And uh, I'll, I'll send you a message in a bit, guys. Thank you so much. One love you. All right. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. See you soon, Dev. Okay. See you soon, That's one, Jack. Bless. Bye -bye. Take care. Cheers. Take, Take care. care.
Right. There you go. So, um, thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, as you can see, I've been messing around with some more little graphics um, as um, <clears throat> the show progresses. Uh, Johnny Greaves, Jeff Jefferson, Andrew Milford, thank you guys for the comments. Bruce Q as well, a, a former guest who we'll be having back. Um, excuse me, I almost died on, a, on a, a sip of water halfway through that conversation. A couple of logos coming up on the screen from people who support me on a monthly basis. I want to show them some love by sharing their logos on the screen. Um, the last few weeks we've had some deep conversations and uh, tonight was a nice break from the deepness talking about music. I think we've had four or five, even possibly six uh, Brummer's Fuck talks with some brilliant guests and uh, they're going to continue as well. So feel free to recommend any names to me. But as I'm sure you're aware, I've got a whole list. Uh, I think I'm booked up now with guests taking me through till the end of February. Next uh, next Tuesday, seven o'clock, I'm going to be talking about men's health matters. Uh, two guys who are going to be talking about their own personal uh, experiences with um, in the battle with men's health uh, as well men's mental health. Um, that's actually what that should say. Just realised that should say men's mental health matters. Um, but that's going to be next Tuesday, seven o'clock. Every Tuesday, seven p.m fairly certain most people know but i'm in spain so now it's just coming up to oh, it's just coming up to 10 o'clock i haven't even had my tea oh guys brilliant uh more people commenting uh thank you to whoever ace 1982 is on youtube i appreciate that um uh, jeff jeff jefferson someone i've known from the age of seven who um has got some incredible tales to tell as well uh, internationally with his work with Miss Moneypennies. We'll get to talk to Jeff at some point. Uh, Julian as well in the Netherlands. How are you, my brother? And uh, Clint, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, right, Johnny Greaves, the House of God, definitely. We can talk, talk about all of those. Uh, um, what was the place called? What was the place called on um, corporate, on the, where the Steelhouse Lane? The big, I can't even think now, Mistress Mo jumps into my head. Anyway, uh, I, I shan't ramble on. Thank you for being here, guys. Two hours of your time is a, lot, is a big ask, and I do appreciate you uh, being here and everybody coming back and commenting, uh, coming back and watching. Please do leave a comment because the guys will be tagged and they'd love to hear your thoughts on it as well. The Q Club. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, yes, uh, the guys would love to read your comments, hear your thoughts, and, and I do appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. I'm going to bounce out now. I bid you farewell. Be good to yourselves. <laughs>